Hey guys, those of you that weren't at the panel earlier, my name is Alan Grant. I'm the co-founder and CTO of a company called Hired.com. We're an online marketplace that basically helps people get jobs that they love. And for companies, we basically help companies compete in the war for talent. But before we get to the war for talent, I want to tell you a little bit about my own personal story and how Hired accidentally got started. So I was actually not born um, Alan Grant. I was born Michael Alexander Sapov in uh, Soviet Ukraine, uh, what used to be the former Soviet Union. And one of my earliest memories from childhood was getting called a capitalist uh, when I kicked a ball on an old lady's lawn. Uh, so she yelled, you capitalist! And I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I was called a capitalist. What does this mean? And he said, well, what you did didn't have anything to do with capitalism. So it means the lady was ignorant. But I'll tell you what capitalism, capitalism is. Capitalism is when you make something that somebody wants, you sell it to them, and then you take the money and you do whatever you want with it. I'm like, well, that sounds pretty reasonable. That sounds like how the world should work. And he said, well, that's not how the world works here in Soviet Union. And so needless to say, um, uh, when I was 10 years old, we moved to America. Uh, I actually changed my name when we got to US. I changed my name to Alan Grant, which was the name of my dad's company when uh, we were growing up. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, he started one of the first companies in, in Ukraine. I was very proud of him. I wanted to be an entrepreneur like my dad when I grew up. And so when I got to college, I started my first company. It's called Webmasters International, and uh, I basically did what I love and what I know, which is web development. And being from Ukraine, I thought that I would combine it with my unique background and basically seek out the great engineers and developer talent over there, do a web development outsourcing company. So this here is actually our very first office that you see in the middle there and on the right. And uh, we started doing some $500 websites, uh, you know, then $1,000 website, $5,000 websites, eventually $30,000, $50,000 websites, and then we got a really big client. And this client said, I will hire all the great engineers that you can get. Hire as many people as you can. So that was the first time that I was actually faced with a war for talent. And it wasn't in the U.S. and Silicon Valley, it was in Ukraine. And it was still really, really hard to build a top-notch team. By the time I graduated, we had built a team of 50 engineers, we had a, a much nicer office, we even uh, had that poster up at a festival in Ukraine just to attract uh, kind of the, the engineers and designers that were coming to this music festival. I thought that we were unstoppable. I'm like, man, business is easy. We're going to build the biggest you know, web company in the world. But unfortunately, life has a way of correcting things when you get a little bit ahead of yourself. And the company basically imploded overnight. So that big client that uh, was promising to pay us a lot of money, well, he was paying us a lot of money. He was responsible for half of our revenue. And then overnight, he defaulted and couldn't pay his bills. We were getting the money from a third party and we had already paid out the salaries and so I was personally liable for the money that he didn't pay. And overnight I went uh, from you know, a, a team of 50 people to being half a million dollars in debt. Right around that time, I went to an event called Global City Entrepreneur Awards. I was nominated for this event, which is an undergraduate competition for entrepreneurs, when things were still going well. And when I arrived, my company was falling apart. So I said, man, this really sucks. I really shouldn't compete. I don't think I even got up there to present. Basically, I felt like a loser. Standing outside, I had to let go of 25 people, half of my company, I remember, on the telephone while I was outside the hotel. And so that, that's sort of how the next uh, stage of my life began. Um, and I actually met my next co-founders at that event. Uh, the day after the competition, while we were in Chicago, me and Tim uh, and Sean basically walked door to door to different hotels trying to pitch them this new idea that we had. Sean said, well, I built a business uh, with Spa Salon software where I gave it away for free and then we make money in credit card processing. We can do the same thing for hotels and we can make a lot of money. So as we went door to door, we would do the math. Like, oh, this hotel has this many rooms, we'd make $30,000 a year. This bigger hotel, we'd make $100,000. And we decided to call the company 3L Systems so that if anybody asks, why did you guys call 3L Systems, we can say, well, we all participated in this competition. We all lost, so we're three losers. Three losers start a company. So that's how uh, 3L Systems got started. And unfortunately, it was, it was true to the name. For three years, we tried to build this software, and it was constantly a year away from being finished. Now, when you start something and it's away from being finished, you know, it's going to take a while. You don't know how long it's going to take. When it's been three years and it's constantly a year away from being finished, you know it's going to take a long time and you have no idea when you're going to get finished. So I started to get a little bit of antsy about this. So I went back to what I knew and loved. I went back to coding. I picked up Ruby on Rails because I wanted to be able to build apps very, very quickly. And I just started hacking on things. I just started figuring out what's going to be the next thing that I build. 
Um, and actually, I don't remember what I was building at the time when I had this next idea, but I wanted to tell all my friends about it. So I said, okay, I'm going to create this thing called Mailytics that's going to import in my entire email history, analyze all the relationships that I have in the email, and quickly build an email list that I can blast with uh, my updates. And this was uh, in November of uh, 2009, and I thought, well, I can do it for the holidays. So two weeks later, and it was still mid-December by that point, the product was done. It was working, and all I needed was the perfect logo. Now, I wasn't happy with any logo. I wanted a really, really good logo because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. And so I went to my favorite site, 99 Designs. Uh, 99 Designs is a site where you can run a design contest. So you can say, I'm going to give $260 to the designer that designs the best logo for me. And then uh, lots of designers will submit different logos and you get to pick the winner. So I thought that it wasn't enough just to use 99 Designs. I wanted to get all the best designers in my contest. So I built a scraper. I downloaded all the data on the website. I built a little algorithm to figure out who the best designers were and a mass mailer to email them all an invitation through the 99design system. So basically I spammed a lot of their users, but it got me 433 designs from 115 designers for only $259. So this was the logo, but it still needed a few tweaks. And so after a few tweaks, here it is, the perfect logo. The only problem was that it was no longer December, it was February, uh, and I had sort of missed the whole holiday season opportunity, and then I really missed it. Uh, I saw this come out February 22nd, 2010, a Y Combinator funded company called eTax Launch, also funded by the creator of Gmail, and they did something seemingly similar. I later found out that what they were doing was actually totally different, but it was similar enough that I thought, well, if I keep going with this, people will think that I'm just copying them and it's going to be lame. I need to find myself some real co-founders that will prevent me from doing stupid things like working on a logo for, for two months. So I did what everybody does when they're down on their luck in America. I went to a bar. Um, except um, I went uh, not to any bar. I went to a special founder dating event where people gather in a bar to meet a, a potential person to start a company with. And I actually met my next two co-founders there, Jeff and Nori. Jeff and Nori were both very impressive. They had both also started companies before. They're both also Ruby and Rails developers. And we knew that together we could build things really, really fast. So the first time that we got together in a coffee shop, we launched a product 12 hours later. It was called Argy4, a Twitter debate system. We didn't know what we were going to build, but we decided to move into a house together for three months away from our girlfriends and wives and significant others so that we can come up with exactly the right idea. We needed a name, and so we called it Curebit. Curebit was uh, a made-up word with an available .com, but we said, well, we're going to cure problems with bits of code. That's sort of how we justified it. And so for three months, we're living in a house, and every week we're launching a new idea to see what's going to work, what's going to stick. And each of the ideas, we wanted to validate them with clients. And so I thought, hey, here's an opportunity to use that scraper that I built for 99 Designs. Let's mail all their designers and pitch them one of the ideas, give them a survey. And um, unfortunately, we got banned. Your account has been suspended for a day with the following title. Uh, feedback needed on new web development uh, uh, startup. But this is not allowed on 99 Designs. It's basically spam. So they banned us. Uh, it was disappointing. But uh, we kept trying. And uh, about a week later, we had our idea. So we were really, really inspired by the Dropbox referral program. The way it worked is that you invite your friend, and they're going to get 250 megabytes of space, and you'll get 250 megabytes of space if they join, what's called a double incentive referral program. This was new at the time, and there were no platforms to do this for e-commerce. And so we said, what if we did that right after somebody buys? Right after you buy a product, you can share it with a friend, and you can give your friend $5 off. And then if your friend buys it, then you're going to get $5 back as if you had the same deal. So I called one of my friends who's in web development. I said, do you have anybody who has an e-commerce site that we can try this out on? He said, sure, I have this friend. Let's try it out at, at the Kosher Express. And so we went live. And in the first day, we were able to help the, create a new sale for them. Somebody saw an offer. They shared. Their friend clicked. They bought. Um, all of a sudden, uh, my friend said, hey, I have five other web development companies, or I have five other e-commerce companies. They all want to use this. And so pretty much overnight, we started to have a lot of demand for this product. It worked. Um, so right around this time, uh, we're trying to figure out how do we get more customers on this. Um, and I went to a conference. I actually went to Web Summit, uh, Web Summit in Dublin. 
And this is an important bit because that's where I actually met my next co-founder, Matt Mitskevich, the co-founder of 99 Designs. I came up to him and I said, hey man, uh, good to meet you. I'm the guy who hacked your site. I scraped all your users and you guys banned me. And he says, oh, cool growth hack. I heard about you. Very entrepreneurial. Sorry we had to ban you. So it was really cool about it. And so we hit it off. Matt and I became friends and started to kind of see each other at conferences after that. He lived in Vancouver me in Silicon Valley, but every once in a while we would get together. So I came back with a perfect plan. I was like, guys, I now know the co-founder of 99designs, let's run the scraper again, let's email everybody on the platform and tell them about our referral program. We can ask them to name it because Curebit's such a bad name, we can ask them to name what the referral program is called and if they have an e-commerce store then they'll sign up. Well, needless to say, we got banned again, this time for a month. Sending multiple PMs to other members, some of which aren't even designers. Subject, name our e-commerce sharing platform. You've been warned before, a third strike and you'll be permanently banned from 99 Designs. Okay, scary, but it actually got us some customers. So it worked. Um, pretty soon we had some real validation, a dream come true. We were funded by Y Combinator and funded by 500 startups as we came out of Demo Day. We launched on Mashable and had 2,200 people reshare the post. Uh, all of a sudden, we started to see copycats popping up in different countries, and there were new products being launched with kind of very, very similar initiatives. We had started a movement. It was really, really exciting. And um, that excitement uh, eventually started to wear off as we got to what's called the Trough of Sorrow. So this little chart is something that was actually drawn um, in Y Combinator on the whiteboard when I joined. And basically this shows the path, typical path of a startup. Let me see if I can walk over like disconnecting. So this part is the tech crunch of initiation when you first launch and everybody hears about you and everybody contacts you and everybody wants to do business with you. Then you get this thing, this quick wearing off of novelty. This happens about a week later. Um, and then you have this trough of sorrow, which may last a long time. You have no idea how long it'll last, and most companies don't get through it. And if you do get through it, maybe you have some releases of improvements, followed by a crash of ineptitude, some wiggles of fa false hope, and then maybe the promised land. And so we were in the trough of sorrow. And the trough of sorrow for us was defined by an absolute lack of press. So we had raised $1.2 million and we tried really, really hard to get TechCrunch to write about it. And almost a year had gone by and we couldn't get an article. And I kept bugging Paul Graham, the godfather of Y Combinator, please email TechCrunch, get us an article. And he said, honestly, Alan, you're going too far. Um, I, I got in his black book. He was not happy about me bugging him all the time. Uh, but finally, at one point, I requested office hours and he emails me and said, if you requested office hours so you can pester me about getting that article, please cancel them. I emailed TechCrunch and we got the article. So these were, this was our releases of improvement. And if you remember what happens on that graph after the releases of improvement, well it's the crash of ineptitude and our crash was really, really hard. For us the crash of ineptitude came like this. For months we tried to get uh, TechCrunch to cover us and all of a sudden within the course of one weekend we had 22 articles about us and they were all negative. And, and it was wor worst of all it was all true. Basically the creator of Ruby on Rails was tweeting at me saying, you guys ripped off my site. And it was true. What was happening at the time is we were running an A-B test of our co homepage against a direct replica copy of a uh, homepage from 37 Signals High Rise product. It was a highly converting product that they had blogged about. And uh, it was such a blatantly bad copy that we were even linking images and backgrounds directly off of their homepage. <laughs> so um, they were pretty pissed about that. Um, we you know, made a course correction on the team, but the damage was done. We went on about our business, going to conference conferences and making sales, but hiring became really, really difficult. We interviewed something like 50 engineers, three of them passed our interview, and none of the good engineers wanted to come work for the company that basically ripped off, you know, DHH. So people were really, really pissed at us. But problems lead to opportunity, and that's how the idea was born. So um, right around that, this time, this is 2012 in April, um, I was getting together for a drink with uh, my now friend Matt Mitskevich, the co-founder of 99 Designs. He flew into San Francisco to speak on a panel about how to start marketplace companies. Another guy who was there at the panel is the guy on the left here, Doug Fierstein. Doug has started a mega successful company called LiveOps, a half a billion dollar marketplace company, one of the first successful marketplace companies. And together, all three of us started to talk about how do we fix this deep problem of, of uh, 
uh, recruiting, of hiring technical talent. And so we started to kind of get ridiculous. We said, well, the, the power is definitely in the hands of the candidate now. What if we were to put the candidate on a pedestal and literally give them a chance to auction themselves off? Say, companies can reach out to me with bids, and I'll go in interview with whichever company I'm interested, but you have to provide the salary and compensation details up front. And I was like, well, that sounds kind of cool. If nothing else, TechCrunch will write about it. They'll say, hi to the bubble, developers selling themselves to the highest bidder. Let's see if we can do this. I can build this in a weekend. Let's see if it works. And actually, it took longer than a weekend. It took three weekends. The first weekend, we built the developer sign-up page. The second weekend, the employer uh, sign-up page. And then finally, in the last weekend, in 36 hours, built the rest of the site. And just as I was going to my annual retreat to a festival called Burning Man, we launched it. I came back to quite a surprise. In two weeks, we had $30 million worth of job offers that were placed on the site. Employers were willing to do this. They were actually willing to do this. A business was born. No hires were made that first week, but we were committed to keep trying it. And within the first few months, we got our first hire. So that was the beginning of a company called Hired. Now I'm going to fast forward you a little bit to the Hired platform today. We rebranded Developer Auction into Hired uh, because we wanted to go beyond developers. Um, and the auction was all, uh, a bit of a misnomer because individuals would know what offer they got, but they didn't have to go to the highest offer. So the way the platform works today basically is that you get compensation details up front. You're also assigned a talent advocate, your personal talent advocate that helps represent you. The emails reach out, the companies reach out to you with personal messages. So you actually get to hear from the hiring manager, not from a recruiter, but from the person trying to recruit you on their team, and they tell you what it's like to work there. You get to see all the other offers, so you get multiple offers from different companies, all within one week. So you're on the platform for one week, and within one week you get multiple offers. And then you get to select which companies you want to go interview with. You can go interview with as many companies as you want, or you can decline all the offers. You don't have to accept any offers that you don't want. The candidate is basically in control. So the way that it, what happens when this happens is basically we see 5 to 15 job offers from about 3,000 companies in a matter of a week, and people get a job in an average of 19 days. So for clients, the way this looks basically is every week there's a new batch of candidates. They're pre-vetted for quality. We only accept the top 3 to 5% into the platform. And they're pre-vetted for being open to hearing about new opportunities. Companies can search and filter and discover people based on whatever factors they want. Um, and the results are staggering. 95% of the time a company reaches out to a candidate, they hear back, versus 10% of the time on LinkedIn. And 50% of the time the candidate actually wants to interview, versus less than 2% of the time on LinkedIn. So in 2015, here is the stats. We've been in business for three years. We're now operating in 14 city cities, 12 in US, as well as Toronto, Canada, and London. Uh, we've had $15 billion worth of job offers placed on the site. We've helped over 1,000 companies make hires, and we've helped uh, 22,000 candidates. The stat that we're most excited about is that we now have somebody getting hired every single hour, 24-7, whereas in Q1 of uh, uh, 2013, it was only happening once every month. So now let's get back to the question of how, how do you win the war for talent? So we have some really interesting stats from having seen 3,000 companies interview uh, you know, tens of thousands of candidates. First question that people ask us is about salaries. So here you can see the salary landscape across the markets that we're in, with salaries ranging from junior developers with less than four years of experience and senior developers with four plus years of experience. Here's how the salary data looks by company size, specifically in Silicon Valley, with seed stage companies paying on average of $125,000 a year for an engineer, and major corporations paying upwards of 140 dollars on average. Here's how it looks by stack, and by stack what we see is that iOS and DevOps engineers are, are very, very popular. The big guys pay even less, or even more. One of the questions that we often get from companies is, how do I compete with the big guys on compensation? And the answer is, you can't. You just can't. You have to do something else. You have to use your innate advantage as a startup. And one of those things is selling on impact. Uh, big companies simply cannot do the thing that you can do. They're, they do not have visionaries recruiting. So make sure that when you're recruiting top talent, that they're talking to your executives, they're talking to your founders, they're understanding the vision and the impact that they can make at the company. 
The second way that you can compete, and probably one of the main ones, is speed. Big companies move slow, and top talent is off the market much quicker. Assume that everybody you're talking to has multiple offers in hand, because if they are the kind of person that you want to hire, they probably do. An interesting stat that we saw is that top talent leaves the market faster. If you have multiple offers, you're more likely to, to close within you know, 16 days versus 23 days. You're on the market shorter. The other thing that's interesting is that if you make an offer within 21 days, we see there is a 75% chance of it getting accepted, 25% chance of it getting declined. And then if you wait more than 21 days, the chance of it getting declined doubles. Know your hiring funnel. Your hiring funnel is basically how many phone screens you're going to have to do to get to an on-site, how many offers to get to hire. And this is going to take a lot of time. So know and be ready for how much time it's going to take. You know, this might take you 55 hours or more just to make a single hire. Be ready to spend that time. If you want to get good at hiring, you have to get good at interviewing. So what predicts interview performance? A meta-analysis study was done at looking at 85 years of research across 19 factors. The most predictive things are work sample tests and structured interviews. Work sample tests are when you give somebody something to do that looks like the actual work that they'll be doing. We give that to everybody, whether they're in a technical or a non-technical role. Um, the, here's a book that I want to leave you with. This book talks about top grading, which is a structured interview process for doing references. We give a copy of this book to every new employee that joins the company. It's basically the Bible for how to hire. It's, it's a very, very easy system that you can learn and start to adapt to your own business. Hiring is going to take a lot of time, so you might as well get good at it. If you have any questions, there's way too much to cover in 20 minutes, but please shoot me an email. Thanks, guys.